You can get mad at a lot of stuff uh, domestically that China does, okay? But the claim that they haven't done a gangbuster job at uplifting their entire uh, population and, and ripping them out of global abject poverty, extreme poverty, is psychotic, okay? Like, Michael Bloomberg sees this. Fucking the World Health Organization and numerous other international capitalist institutions recognize it and literally take advantage of that. They say capitalism uplifted billions out of poverty. No, motherfucker, it's not capitalism that did that. China did that, okay? Without China, the planet is worse off. All right, um, let's continue with the Democracy Russia and now, China together. Org face consequences if it provides material support to Russia. It was the first call between the two leaders um, of the world's two largest economies in four months. In February, Russian President Vladimir Putin traveled to Beijing for talks with Xi ahead of the invasion. Earlier this month, China joined India, Iran, Pakistan, and 32 other nations from the global south in abstaining from a United Nations vote condemning Russia's war in Ukraine. On Saturday, China's vice foreign minister criticized NATO as a, quote, Cold War vestige and criticized Western sanctions on Russia, saying globalization is being used as a weapon. To look more at China's evolving relations with both Russia and the United States, we're joined by Alfred McCoy, professor of history at University of Wisconsin-Madison, author of numerous books, most recently, To Govern the Globe, World Orders and Catastrophic Change. His recent article for The Nation is headlined, Russia and China. Um, Dmitry Alperovich says, fascinating claim to intercept a call from Russian officer near Mikolaev. Here is in Russia. He says, this is worse than Chechnya. Yeah, of course it is. 50% of troops have frostbite. They can't evacuate the dead. Don't have enough tents. Are you plane dropped the bomb on their own position? One column was hit with grad rockets. Can't even figure out who it was. Friendly fire. Medics have only bandages. Can't help with frostbite. No hot stove. Digging trenches to sleep in. Commander of the 49th CA told troops fourth day of the war will be over in hours. Troops don't have body armor. When one complained, the commander Shally was told, son, be strong. Pug, the special Shally operations of Madhouse. Pug, Shally, Being told not to destroy Pug, buildings Pug, is Shally, insanity. Unless we destroy Pug, everything and Pug, turn it into dirt along with civilians, Pug. nothing can happen. TV says we're moving forward where we just drive through without clearing up villages. And now we have to defend from all sides because they're attacking everywhere. Uh, I don't know if this is, uh, you know, I don't know what these intercepted calls look like. Because from what I understand, it's not as cold as, uh, like it hasn't snowed in fucking weeks. It hasn't snowed of a, uh, in a week. Um, it seems like it might be worse than Chechnya. 80 to 100,000 people died. Well, the reason, worse than Chechnya for them, for the Russians. Because, you know, they're Hassle. not leveling the cities as hard. Uh, but they are kind of in Mariupol. They are doing it in Mariupol. You don't need snow to get frostbite, though. Yeah, you need it to be like sub-zero temperature, though, or which I don't think it's. I don't think it is. <sighs> no, you don't, lol. I mean, it needs to be sub. Okay, hold on. We're, we'll look at this in a second. One Together second. at last. Welcome back to Democracy Now, Professor McCoy. Why don't you start off by responding to the talk that President Biden and Xi Jinping had on Friday, what we learned of what they said? Apparently, what, Professor, I'm sorry, um, what President Biden was hoping to accomplish in his phone conversation with Xi Jinping was to draw on their successful video meeting last November and kind of encourage or even pressure President Xi to back away from China's strong support for Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And that did not happen. Uh, President Xi's quote, the most memorable, the most important quote, was he wanted the United States to untie the knot of Ukrainian and Russian security. And that was a kind of oblique reference to the idea that the United States and NATO are responsible for Russia's invasion of Ukraine by expanding NATO right up to the borders of Russia and threatening Russian security. And that's also a reference to the historic meeting between Putin and Xi Jinping on February 4th of this year, when the two met uh, during the Winter Olympics, and they issued an historic- Chat, sub-zero means 32 degrees Fahrenheit, you Amerabrained, Americentric fucking weirdos.
I love that I saw that like as I was walking away everyone was like oh my god you idiot it has to be 32 no I meant like sub-zero as in as in you know celsius god damn dude sorry that I didn't use your dumbass methodology for once it's the stupidest like Fahrenheit is the stupidest way to to analyze weather and 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 temperature sorry it's just so stupid almost as dumb as the feet uh, instead of the metric system it, it's just oh god i hate it i hate it so much you don't understand i hate it 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 one day one day anyway, how many stones do you weigh yeah whatever i hate another thing i hate is forgetting the top of the hour ad break and not running it it's another thing i hate and then forgetting to mention that you know you can avoid those ads as long as you subscribe for five dollars or for free Here's the woman I break now. We're at 5,300 word declaration that <clears throat> laid claim to establishing a kind of new global order uh, to attacking U.S. global hegemony and to build upon their strong bilateral alliance, their this uh, tank very is close economic one, yeah. integration in the it's field out. of energy, and to... Uh, uh, simultaneously block NATO from threatening Russia and uh, uh, block the United States from supporting Taiwan against China's legitimate claims to Taiwan. Uh, and so, in effect, what that meeting failed to accomplish was it simply failed to break this emerging alliance between China and Russia, which is literally shaking the current world order. I wanted to turn to Chingang, the Chinese ambassador to Press the United Thursday, States, like appearing on CBS's Face the Nation Sunday. He was questioned by Margaret Brennan. Has Xi Jinping, your president, told Vladimir Putin to stop the invasion? Do you condemn it? Actually, on the second day of uh, Russia's deal, military operation, up. President Xi Jinping did talk to President Putin. Uh, was that their last Asking phone call? President Putin to think about resuming peace talks with Ukraine. And President Putin listened to it, and Happy we have months, seen four rounds of peace talks uh, mm -hmm. you know, have happened. Let me continue. You know, China's trusted relations with Russia is not a liability. Actually, it's an asset in the international efforts to solve uh, the crisis in a mm -hmm. peaceful way, you know. And the China is part of the solution. It's not part of the problem. Professor McCoy, can you respond to the significance of what when the Chinese ambassador rain. to the when United States said? No rain. Of course. <clears throat> He's again kind of affirming what President Xi said in that meeting last Friday with uh, President Biden, in, in essence, that China is not going to rupture its relations with Russia. It's not going to apply pressure on Russia. It's not going to blame Russia. Now. It's not Any going to uh, call the, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine an invasion. Um, and it is going to affirm that Russia has legitimate security concerns in Ukraine that must be met. And that if China is going to do anything, it is going to apply its L considerable international is power and prestige more. to support Russia in establishing its security in Eastern Europe. Uh, <clears throat> what, what I think what's going on more broadly is that we're seeing a, a sense of extraordinary confidence from Moscow and Beijing that literally history and, more importantly, geopolitics is on their side. They believe that their alliance gives them such dominance, such power on the massive Eurasian landmass that they can prevail, that they can not only dominate the landmass, they can dominate exactly. international politics. In essence, they are pursuing a geopolitical strategy to break U.S. control over the Eurasian landmass and thereby break U.S. global power. They think that they are yeah. witnessing the birth, the historic birth, of a new world order in which the great months, global hegemon, the United States, which has dominated the world for the past 70 years, in which its global power is broken and, it, and, and its dominance over Eurasia, something the United States has maintained since the start of the Cold War in the early 1950s, 
that that is coming also to an end. This is the White House press secretary, Jen Psaki, talking about Biden's meeting with Xi Jinping on video phone call. The movement of, uh, of uh, China to align with Russia or to, um, uh, yeah, the movement of them to align with Russia or their, their proximity of moving closer together is certainly of great concern to us, as we have expressed. And we are not the only country that has expressed that concern, including many other members of the G7 have expressed exactly that concern. Uh, so this is part of the discussion. It has been an ongoing part of the discussion. Expect it certainly would be when the president goes to Europe uh, next Eight week, but we're not in a place at this point to outline the specifics we're still discussing. So if you can talk more about, Professor McCoy, what Biden threatened, um, is if it has an effect. Uh, you know, he is going to Europe this week. He's speaking with a lot of European nations today, then meeting in Brussels you, with Saki. other NATO members. Um, is this good or bad? Isn't China a worse version of the U.S. in some measures? I don't know. Is it? I've heard both sides of this argument. On the one hand, I've heard that a multipolar world, or at least a, a two power, two great powers fighting against one another, benefits the American, uh, the American war machine, and it actually benefits America's influence over the Western world, which is waning at this point, since America has dominated the planet for a very long time. Now, so they they stand to benefit from propping up uh, enemies. So that they can reinforce their uh, reinforce their power over you know European nation states, right? But for the people who say like, isn't China worse? I mean, America pound for pound as the hegemonic power has caused way more death and destruction. Like we don't know, we don't know what China will do, but we have a fear of the unknown that could be somewhat legitimate. But so far, that fear is just out of you not being in the imperial core. for all. Let's go. That's it. I mean, the notion that like, you know what this argument always reminds me? One of my favorite fucking takes is whenever people say, oh, that country can't have nuclear weapons. What if they're the irresponsible with the nukes? When, American power is and it's when, a, when an American says that, I laugh because historically speaking, there's only one country that is our, that has used nukes on a civilian population deliberately. And that's the United States of America. What the fuck do you mean? You're always like, oh, man, what if they use a nuke? Like, they can go crazy. I'm like, well, you know, you're the one who's literally fucking used it. Members and going to Poland to hold bilateral talks Friday and Saturday. Um, what this means for Russia and then for Russia and China. The, the United States is concerned, I think, in two areas. Uh, one, that, uh, that China will provide uh, weaponry and financial support. And in fact, China can break the, the financial embargo that the United States is trying to impose upon Russia in order to restrain them in their invasion of Ukraine. And so what, what Washington is monitoring is flows of weapon and <clears throat> flows of, of, of financial support from China to Russia. That's, that's what the United States is trying to restrain. Uh, and that, <clears throat> the weapons may have a, a, a short-term impact, one. the financial flows a, a medium term impact. That, that's the U.S. concern. But um, I think we need to sort of analyze the situation in dual tracks. One, focus on, on the diplomacy, the military activity in Ukraine, the course of the war on the battlefield. Okay, and That may or may not go Putin's way. But <clears throat> underlying that, there is this extraordinary confidence in Moscow and Beijing that the that's geopolitics done. of Eurasia are on their side that because of their alliance and their dominant position in this great landmass that comprises 70% of the world's population and productivity, that, that it almost inevitably that they are going to emerge as the new centers of global power on the planet. And, and that, I think, is underlying their boldness uh, and their resistance to, to Washington's pressure. So we can, in, in, from their perspective, we can provide weapons. We can mount financial pressure. Uh, we can even uh, uh, imp imp impact the, the situation on the battlefield by providing um, anti-tank missiles and and, and, uh, and handheld weapons that can uh, uh, they can bring like Stinger missiles that can bring down Russian helicopters and aircraft. Um, uh, we can do all that, but but that is not material. That's not what's going to matter. They believe because of the, the theory of geopolitics, that 
being the dominant powers in this great Eurasian landmass, that they can slowly break the controls that the United States has imposed over Eurasia since the start of the Cold War. And the difference is in China, you say the wrong thing, you die or disappear or are a slave for the rest of your life with no freedoms at all, not to mention that they're no stranger to ethnic cleansing. I don't know where to begin with this one, okay? Because you live in America, so I don't know what to tell you about that because you're oblivious to, like, our prison system. There, that's number one. It's so funny. It's always like, China has work camps. They have work, labor prisons. Like, like okay, what do, we, what, what do we call American prisons then? Straight from Reddit? Yeah. So that's, that's one. And then two is that, like, China is more aggressive with internally policing its... Um, with internally policing its own uh, citizens uh, and, and maintaining some, uh, uh, you know, in, maintaining a lot of control over the flow of information, whereas America is not. There's a different way of controlling the flow of information in neoliberal capitalist countries. But having said that, when you think about what America is doing to the rest of the fucking planet, you know, America, in comparison to China, has been significantly more deadly to other people. I'm talking about China's dealing uh, with its own citizens, citizens within its own borders. I know, I know Chatter said they're not American, they're Polish. And they can break U.S. global power, and they together can construct a new global order. Every global hegemon, and that's the word that Beijing and, and, and Moscow use, every like global hegemon for the last 500 years, from the Portuguese to the Spanish, the Dutch, the British, the United States, and now the Chinese— have done one thing in common. They have all dominated Eurasia. The, their rise to the- The chatter is talking about imprisonment of its own citizens. You go on to talk about America's treatment of other countries. Yeah, of course I talk about America's treatment of other countries because we're, con we're currently talking about how China would be as a global superpower. What the f kind of dumbass take is this, dude? Yeah, obviously. <laughs> I'm, I'm already recognizing that, yes, Chinese, uh, the Chinese control over the flow of information is devastating, terrible. Uh, some of that is also backed by, uh, beefed up by American propaganda to make it seem like, you know, uh, the, the Chinese prison system is, like, significantly worse than the American prison system. When in comparison to, like, the European prisons uh, that we look at, American prison system is just as horrifying as the chinese one uh and also there are more prisoners per capita in the united states of america than china uh you can turn around and say china doesn't reveal their numbers all you want but such is the reality okay but even then i already mention and admit that of course yes while china does have way 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 more rigorous uh and and rigid control over its own population which is what i already described as far as what they do to other civilians and civilians in other countries, it's not even comparable. The death and devastation that America has subjected the rest of the planet is not even comparable to what China has done so far. Five months of this does not money. mean, however, that like China is going to be better as a hegemonic power than the United States of America, for the record, uh, because I also concede that as a hegemonic power, they will probably also be brutal as fuck. So, so far, yeah, that's the point. China's going to be much, much worse. You have no way of knowing that. And that's precisely what I mentioned. You don't have a way of knowing that. But not only do you not have a way of knowing that, you have no evidence to suggest that. And you're also simultaneously overlooking evidence, like the mountain of evidence of, of how bad we have been so far. That's my issue with this conversation. My issue with this conversation is that you know, people will say China is corrupt or China is violent and bloodthirsty only to neglect our corruption and our thirst and our bloodshed that we are causing currently all around the world right now. And yes, the United States does restrict the flow of information. Yes, Chelsea Manning is a good example of this. Edward Snowden is still living in exile. There are plenty of instances where whistleblowers are punished unjustifiably. People are heroes and should not be punished in a country that's truly Don't living up to its well. libertarian free speech values. None of these people would be uh, considered um, enemies of the state and would actually be, uh, you know, Julian Assange is another example as well. Uh, they would be considered, uh, you know, heroes, right? So clearly that doesn't happen. However, in China, uh, the barrier of like what constitutes a jailable offense, and same with Turkey, for example, 
is much, much lower. Now, that hasn't stopped America from absolutely destroying Turkey's prison numbers, okay? Regardless of, of having bad. free speech in this country, free speech, uh, plenty of Black Lives Matter protesters are in jail. There was an anarchist that literally posted about fucking defending yourself from Nazis in Florida. Uh, I think Daniel Baker is his name. He's in jail still. Uh, and, and uh, you know, the January 6th protesters are not, but that's different. You know, freedom of speech, freedom of speech. We have no BDS. We have no free speech for BDS. You have to literally fucking, you know, but our population is bigger. Yeah, you know, bigger as in what, fatter? So the per capita argument changes all of a sudden? Is that what you mean? Do they occupy a larger space? America houses 25% of the entire fucking planet's imprisoned population. 25%, despite making up 5% of the entire country, uh, entire world's population, okay? So even though we have fucking free speech, or what you consider to be free speech, which is usually speech without repercussions for, you know, uh, uh, people hey, who yeah. are engaging in all manner of, like, hate speech, okay? Ultimately, you can call Joe Biden Brandon or say he looks like Winnie the Pooh or a decrepit corpse without suffering consequences as you would in Turkey or suffering the consequences as you would in China. But the difference there is we still end up somehow managing to jail a fuckload of humans. So shut the fuck up about the land of the free. Global power, including the U.S. rise to global power after World War II, was accompanied by dominance over Eurasia. And the decline of all of these global powers, including the United States, has been marked by their declining control over Eurasia. And together, uh, Beijing and Moscow are pursuing a strategy that I call, you know, push, push, punch. So they're pushing at these great chains of geopolitical control that the United States has ringed around Eurasia since the Cold War. Naval fleets air bases, um, mutual defense packs. They're pushing slowly at the east and west ends of Eurasia, hoping to strain and break those chains of control that the United States has imposed over Eurasia until in a succession of these punches, Old man those chains of control snap, U.S. dominance over Eurasia comes to an end, and correspondingly, in the theory of geopolitics, U.S. global power also declines. So, Professor McCoy, <clears throat> one of the key reasons binding Russia to China, in addition to what you've been talking about, is that Russia is a major energy exporter. China is one of the world's leading energy importers. Put that together with uh, The Wall Street Journal reporting last week, Saudi Arabia's inactive talks so with Beijing to price some of its I've oil so sales to China you. in yuan, a move that would dent the U.S. Here's the difference. Here's the main difference. And part of why I do actually uh, have to hand it to China, okay? In China, the government works to a larger degree at the behest of the prosperity of its citizens than the government in the United States of America. Yes, they are way more strict. Yes, they will f*** you up if you speak out of turn. But ultimately, it is the reality whether you want to admit it or not. And the control mechanism in places like China <clears throat> is the volatility... The famine, the likelihood that maybe famine could occur or volatility could occur, and a mass uprising could happen. Historically, this is what keeps governments and administrations in places like China in check. Less than three. Okay? Now, it's authoritarian, so that is true. And sometimes it's authoritarian towards the billionaires and the corporate uh, overlords. Okay? But to make that comparison to the United States of America... Are also, we do have a lot of authoritarianism in this country as well. I mean, uh, there's plenty of things that are considered abhorrent, illegal, you can't do, um, or, or even, uh, I don't know, you have a lack of significant access to. You're doing a great job, Hassan. I personally think it's, it's immoral and, abhor and morally abhorrent and, and violent for a country that has the capability of, of offering, um, a country that has the capability of offering everyone unconditionally shelter and food and and uh, health care to refuse to do so to be incredibly morally abhorrent like i, I think that's it's terrible that's america our government works at the behest of corporations the chinese government's corporations work at the behest of the government which has uh more of an accountability despite not having democratic means to do so to its own nation's prosperity i've seen videos of chinese policemen pulling out their out of their houses and onto the streets the man crying 
Yeah, of course, dude. No government is good. Chinese government is not good, okay? But if you think that, like, we don't have that shit in America, like, there are a million videos that you can watch of American police brutalizing the fuck out of people. Homeless people, uh, people protesting for Black Lives Matter. What the fuck do you mean? Were you not here when the George Floyd protests were happening? How do you think American evictions take place, dude? You guys not remember the family that was ripped away from housing that is currently owned by the California state that is just empty? Squatters on Thanksgiving night. A family of squatters on Thanksgiving night were ripped away from an empty house that the California state owns. You think they were enjoying it? You think they were like, oh man, this is great. Uh, Moms Against Homelessness, I think, was, wasn't it? In Oakland? Hi. The group of, of uh, black mothers in Oakland that were like literally sieged on by the local police department that came in and literally brought in APCs, tanks, to violently rip pregnant black mothers out of this house that they were living in. You're gonna tell me that that shit is like different? No, it's not. It's not different. You live in a country where cops will literally break into your house and put a bullet in the back of your head and totally get away with it, okay? Another month. So just your fucking remember that. Now more than ever. Thank you for all that you tackle on here at Hassan Abbey. And this does not mean that, like, China is doing a great job. It just simply means that when China does the same exact shit, if not, if not shit that's not as bad of, of what you see in America, Thank what you, you cover in America on a daily basis, on China. Um, it, it, you're, you just refuse to recognize that, like, we do the same exact shit. So ultimately, no matter whether China is in power or America is in power, I think it's still going to fucking suck. But it might be different. I don't know. But I at least admit that I don't know. My immediate uh, disposition isn't like, oh, China taking over or having a two, um, China, uh, China being a part of a, a, a multipolar world and, and also being a, a dominant power in the, in the global uh, geopolitical struggle uh, is going to automatically mean it's bad, you know? U.S. dollars dominance of the global petroleum market. China buys more than a quarter of the oil that Saudi Arabia exports. If priced in yuan, uh, those sales would boost the standing of China's currency. Can you talk about the significance of both the currency and uh, uh, energy politics? Sure. One of the foundations of U.S. global powers, right since the end of World War II, has been that the dollar has been the functional global reserve currency. That was set at the Bretton, Win yep. Bretton Woods Conference in 1944. Um, in 1971, when President Nixon ended the automatic convertibility of, of dollars to gold, Saudi Arabia announced that they would keep uh, 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 conducting their, their petroleum transactions in dollars. And since oil is the most negotiated of all international commodities, if the world is doing its oil business in dollars, that means the dollar has that continuing support as global reserve currency. Since 2015, the Chinese currency has become a part of the international basket of currencies recognized by the International Monetary Fund. And as China's dominance over the global economy grows and it becomes the world's largest economy, the Chinese currency's role in that international economy is going to increase. And once the dollar declines, that is the, the most negotiable, the most visible August. part of U.S. global dominance. That global dominance will follow the decline of the dollar downward. How do you see all of this playing out, Professor McCoy? Short term, uh, I think that we're, what we're looking Under Chinese rule, innovation and entrepreneurship probably will not prosper as much as it has under capitalism in the U.S.? Why? What, because of a lack of IP laws or whatever in China? Is that what you, is that what you genuinely think? Dude, the dogma of capitalist thought is so pervasive and so powerful that people unironically will like defend patent oh, laws champ. and, and like super rigid copyright and IP laws. It's wild. It's absolutely fucking wild to me. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. How about, how about we get more, f at least high speed rail, you know, when, when China dominates the planet, let's do that. Looking at it as a kind of a parallel of what happened with the last time China and Russia were allied. In the early 1950s, Mao Zedong went to Moscow. He was a supplicant. He formed an alliance with Joseph Stalin. And Joseph Stalin cashed in that alliance very quickly by using China uh, to 
uh, entered the Korean War. Uh, China fought in Korea for three years. It cost them about 40 percent of China's budget, uh, 200,000 dead Chinese soldiers. Uh, we're looking at it as kind of a, a reprise of that. You know, Putin comes to, to Beijing in February in the Winter Olympics. He's now the supplicant. He needs China's diplomatic and economic support for his Ukraine invasion. And so at the moment of this very strong alliance, again, and this time Putin attacks. He's sacrificing his budget, his soldiers, all right, in this strategy of pushing and pushing and breaking Putin the U.S. The dominance the over Eurasia. I see. And Sino-Soviet relations have never been better, boys. I mean, even though, you know, I don't consider Russia to be anywhere even attempting a uh, socialist transitional state. Even if you One were to say bait. that China Let's is, go. that is doing state capitalism, is not doing state capitalism, but China is like trying its own version of a uh, transitional socialist state, which, you know, that much is also uh, questionable. Um, 12 months, no brain rot. There is a, uh, you know, Soviet relations have never been better. Long term, um, the growing power of China over the Eurasian continent, their Belt and Road Initiative. This trillion dollar development program that now incorporates around 70 nations in Eurasia and Africa, laying down infrastructure, pipelines, railroads, and roads across the whole Eurasian landmass. If this development project succeeds. Are you doing a bad job of the socialism part, though? Yeah, totally, dude. Okay. I mean, I've talked about this before, but like, you can get mad at China for being brutal to minority populations, which is totally valid, fair, justifiable. You can get mad at China for being brutal to its rural population uh, and, and not allowing them passports to go into the cities and have like the same kind of job opportunities. You can get mad at a lot of stuff uh, domestically that China does, okay? But the claim that they haven't done a gangbuster job at uplifting their entire uh, population and, and ripping them out of global abject poverty extreme poverty is psychotic okay like michael bloomberg sees this fucking the world health organization and numerous other international capitalist institutions recognize it and literally take advantage of that they say capitalism uplifted billions out of poverty no mother it's not capitalism that did that china did that okay without china the planet is worse off Abject, uh, like, complete extreme poverty, even when you tweak the metrics and change it, as, uh, as these institutions have time and time again, the, the third world is worse off, with the exception of what China has been able to accomplish. And they didn't do that because they were able to do super capitalism, okay? Super capitalism is what you see in America. The only reason why China was able to get out of the situation they were in was because the inflow of foreign capital allowed them because they did throw human labor at the problem 100 percent and and that dang was uh correct in his gambit he was right okay right on two things one that uh, american capital owners will literally f destroy their own working class and their own productive capabilities if they can make a tidy profit okay and it's true, they did do that. American greed destroyed the American uh, workforce, okay? And they will literally allow us to, like, steal their IP, all this other shit. Like, they don't give a f okay? Also true, Cur currently happening. And ultimately, that um, uh, he was right when he said socialism is not about poverty. It's, it's socialism is to be glorious. Those, those are the two things. <laughs> but nothing else. But like I said, it's not the capitalism... Uh, allow China to prosper. It's all of the, the, the infrastructure projects that they were able to engage in. Okay. They control the worst part of China. No, I think their, their, uh, their treatment of, uh, or their honification strategies are the worst part of China. State control is not the worst part of China. State control is fucking awesome. At least over the economy. It's if you're, even if you're a social Democrat, you want that. So you're wrong. Like, so they, or you're just not a social Democrat. You're literally a neoliberal.
What is social democracy if not literally fucking demanding that people make voluntary donations in the form of taxes, uh, changing the tax code, nationalizing extraction industries, making sure that you have a, a, a serious stake in the ownership of all these companies that you've pumped the fuckload of investment into? What do you think I want when I say we need to, you know, bring these oil and gas industry executives to heal? What the f do you think I'm talking about? When I say that, this is the unfortunate reality that most of these social democrats that like think like, oh, I love Bernie, I love Bernie, I love Bernie, literally are just like, they're just liberals who want health care, I think. But don't recognize what it takes to get that health care. Because socialized medicine is inherently anti-capitalist, okay? If there is money to be made from an industry, then capital owners are going to do everything in their power to maintain that position. They're not going to be magnanimous and offer you something. The only reason why they gave you a, a crumb of socialized medicine in the form of free vaccines that were distributed to every single person is because you slaves needed to get back to work without dying every week, without causing complete economic collapse. And even then they couldn't fucking do it right. There was no genuine humanitarian interest there. The only reason why actual socialized medicine was was immediately put to work in america which was a the one instance where i've ever felt proud of america the one fucking time dude was when i was driving into that mass vaccination facility it was it fucking turned me on i wanted to get like boosted up every week after that i was like fuck i just want to go back and keep getting this like to feel like i live in a civilized nation that takes care of its citizens and the only time they did that they did that so that you fucking cattle could get back to your wage slavery, okay? What? Bernie Sanders no, ran on a plank of folding the empire peacefully? Wait, 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 wait. I love Bernie Sanders. He's my favorite politician. I love Bernie Sanders. I love Jeremy Corbyn. I have disagreements with them, obviously, on certain issues. I don't give a shit. Anyone that shits on Bernie is wrong, straight up. Bernie, we don't deserve Bernie. I, I don't misunderstand me. I was just saying a lot of people misunderstood what Bernie Sanders meant. He wasn't just talking about Medicare for all. Wait, Sam was positive about America. Are you feeling okay? I thought there was nothing redeemable. I mean, are no, I why do I live here, man? I like I I love the potential of the United States of America. I do. But it grosses me out that we have all that potential and we squander it on purpose. Deliberately throw it, cast it aside for you know, the profit motive. Cast it aside where we place the profits of mega corporations exactly. and those sitting at the top of those corporations, the shareholders, the capital owners. Toss it aside uh, at the behest of uh, the people that we could easily help. Not trying to dogpile or anything, but let's not forget China has crazy income inequality and no freedom of press or speech. I think they definitely have some great, great, great characteristics, but they also are imperialist capitals and real shitty imperialist. Okay. Like you say Africa, but I think you misunderstand like how much the, how the tentacles of imperialism works. If you consider china's actions in the one belt one road initiative to be imperialist then you got to find a separate designation for what the western nation states have done and continue to do so in those very same african countries like china's not controlling their fucking you know central bank and shit you know what i mean like that's and that's like an inoffensive thing that france does for example in comparison to all the other shit that they do also um for example why do people think Africa is turning to China? Surely they have to know why. No, you will never be able to get to, through the thick skull of an American. Uh, why uh, African nations literally prefer Chinese loans over it's the World Bank and IMF? Imperialism where markets are the battlefield, sir. They tried it. I don't know much about China, but would their control over non-Han territories be considered imperialist? Ex Xinjiang posting twice because I don't know. Listen. I think China's current treatment or uh, treatment over the past couple of years over the Muslim Uyghurs is, is abhorrent. It's disgusting. It's cultural genocide. But just look back in Xinjiang's history to try to understand when it was non-Chinese uh, controlled territory, um, like akin to uh, America's control over, uh, you know, America's control over any territory whatsoever. <laughs> America as a nation state project. It's funny USA wants to buy Venezuelan oil now. I, I don't think it's funny. I think it's disgusting that they uh, sanctioned Venezuela for as long as they did. But, you know, um, Poop streaks. the only thing these fucking pig dogs understand is, is starvation and, and having, uh, being in a position where you have to beg. 
disgusting. Literally disgusting. I mean, straight up. Oh my god. Um, I want to give a shout out to the Ed Markey team. I, from what I understand, uh, Senator Mackey is currently live and alive, and and he is uh, his style apparently resembles uh, his his streaming style uh, apparently resembles. Very closely to a uh, stream that you know and love, uh, mine. Let me see real quick. We got 62 viewers. Actually, draw a picture and pretend to be an artist. So maybe we could have you stand up and, and try to draw. I, I will try to do this, but the word, the key word there was not artist. The key word there was pretend. Okay, so I, I am a, definitely a pretend artist here. But the goal that we have, and maybe you could give me some of these um, devices over here. Maybe you can give me solar. So, solar. so for solar in our country, and again, no matter what we're talking about here, we're talking about some of the richest renewable resources in the world. And we already have them, except when only exploiting a small fraction of them. And if we put a plan in place, we can move this clean energy from where it is. Here's solar. Uh, and I'm not telling anyone on Twitch where it's warm in the United States, but you all know that it's warm in this part of the United States, right? And if we captured that solar and started to wheel it, started to move that energy to other parts. Shout out, Freud, you're also a mirror brain to a certain level when it comes to the issue when you try to compare China to the U.S., but compared to other regional powers, China's significantly dog shit. Does anyone want to guess where Shout and Freud is from? anyone want to guess what country schadenfreude is from big one it's a big one that a lot of people compare china to no not vietnam was too broke to sub for a while but appreciate the news content thank you i think i'm i'm gonna I'm go ahead and say that i think I, i'm being less biased uh than than you might be in this situation german name but no he's he's indian hassle Bernie says, congratulations to the Starbucks Workers United on the historic achievement of organizing the first ever union at a company-owned Starbucks in the United States. The company should stop pouring money into the fight against the union and negotiate a fair contract now. Hey, if you like this video, please subscribe and hit that bell so you don't miss out on any future videos. <laughs>